Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. My name is Kim Ricketts, and I manage with Kirsten Wiley the Microsoft Research Visiting Speaker Series. So thank you for joining us. I don't know what was happening in 112 there with the alarm, but maybe it'll just bring everyone back over here. So today, I'm, I'm very thrilled to introduce to you Dr. James Martin. He, um, reading his bio would, would just floor you and, and make you so you couldn't probably ask a question. but. I will begin with the fact that he's written over a hundred books on technology. A couple of them, um, one was nominated for the Pulitzer Prize, it was called The Wired Society, which he wrote in 1977. I don't know, has anybody any of you read that book? And um, it foresaw, in fact, um, a world of cell phones and the internet way back then. Um, and then in the 80s, he wrote a book called Technology's Crucible, where he wrote about um, a terrorist attack on New York City. So to say he's a futurist in a scary way is not, is not at all untrue. And if you are a futurist, as um, Dr. Martin is, and someone that's always working far ahead on, on the issues before us, I think it, there's, it's a both a blessing and a curse, because he's now looking at the future and seeing not such a great one, um, and perhaps not one at all, with the things that are facing the world now. So um, rather than being depressed by it, he decided to um, gather the forces of, particularly of the brains we have on the, on the planet right now, and the technological tools we have on the planet. And he believes we, we get all those things together in one place, we can actually solve the greatest problems facing humanity right now. And that's exactly what um, he did at Oxford University. He endowed a school to gather all those things together. It's called the James Martin 21st First Century School, and I'm so I'm thrilled to welcome to Microsoft Research James Martin. Thank you. <laughs> the 21st century is going to be very different from any other century, and it's uh, it's a pivotal century. We've got to get things right in this century, otherwise humanity and the planet are going to be the hell of a mess. And so it's very important to understand the, the big trends. What can go wrong? Some of them are well known. You know, global warming, we're destroying the climate. There are other things which are going wrong as well. And the good news is that once you understand them, once you understand global warming, for example, it's not all that difficult to change it and to correct it. Um, for example, we have caught 90% of the fish in the oceans. The oceans are so huge, you know, if you sail across the oceans, you say, how on earth can we have destroyed 90% of the fish in oceans this vast? But the rate at which we're destroying them now is faster than the rate before it's accelerating. And if we go on like we're going on now, um, there won't be any uh, fishing in, in the oceans. And uh, so two, 20 years from now, we could reach a, a point of no return where the oceans are something we can't recover. Now, once again, the answer to that is really very simple. And we're paying huge subsidies to, for people to go and fish. And a few years ago, for example, the total amount of um, um, money that was spent on fishing was 150 50 billion dollars in one year, but the value of the fish caught was about 100 billion dollars. So, in effect, we're making a loss of 50 billion dollars. And that loss comes from subsidies, which you are paying. It's part of your taxes, and it's very important for the people who want that money that you don't know that, and they hide it. So the world is absolutely full of subsidies, which you pay, it's all part of taxes, which are totally hidden from you. And now if we could stop completely the evil subsidies which are destroying the oceans, then there's a whole lot of technological actions that we could take, none of which are rocket science, in which we could make the oceans recover, um, so that 20 years from now the fish are beginning to multiply, and 40 years from now we, we go back to a world which has got far more fish than we have got today. So it's a solvable problem. Anyway, there's a whole lot of problems like that, and the thing which makes the 21st century so special is that these things have got so big, our activities, human activities have got so big that they overwhelm the planet. For example, population is, is very big now and it's likely to go up to about 9 billion people. And if you had 9 billion people wanting to drive cars like we do and wanting to have air conditioning like we do, then that would absolutely totally wreck the, the climate of the planet. And uh, there's so many uh, numbers you can use like that as we look at the 21st century where we'd say those numbers are getting too big for the planet to handle. So this is a, a very special century. We've got to get those things under control. 
And that means we uh, need to have people understanding what is happening, understanding the problems, and understanding the solutions to the problems. And ultimately the people who are going to get these things under control are people who are our kids now. I like to call them the transition generation. People born between about 1985 and about uh, um, 1920, uh, to 2020, so the transition generation. I like to call them the T generation. So it's the T generation. You can see them all over the planet. Uh, un unlike previous generations, they're all on the internet. Uh, in just about any country, they speak English on the internet. You go to China, you know, China tried to ban the internet. And all, all the kids, you know, the 14-year-olds are on the internet all the time and they're finding uh, sites on the internet where they can communicate with people all over the planet on these subjects. And so you've got a, a, a rising new generation which is globally connected. And this has never happened before. So again, as we move into the 21st century, we, we would say we've got huge problems to solve, to solve, but we've also got massive tools with which we can set out to solve those problems. And of course, many of the massive tools have been provided by Microsoft. And so one of my views about Microsoft is there's such a force. It's changed so much in the world, all, all over the world, and I think it's going to continue to change things in a big way. I saw some of the um, demonstrations of uh, the Surface, the Microsoft Surface. <laughs> the incre incredible new things which are going to come from Microsoft. And so Microsoft is a force for change all over the world, which is very much uh, in communication with the T generation. And so it would really make sense to say, let's get Microsoft understanding the stuff we want to talk about now and uh, getting that communicated to everybody and understanding the solutions <coughs> and understanding very strongly indeed that Microsoft is part of the solution and if it understands how it is part, part of the solution then it's going to be more effective in making the changes which are necessary changes. Now the presentation I've got here was supposed to be two hours and I've only got one hour so I'm going to skip a lot of slides so you'll see quite a lot of things moving past too fast. <coughs> the um, 18th century was quite extraordinary. We suddenly got a bunch of uh, men, all men, no women, in the north of England who rode to each other's houses on moonlit nights because there were lots of robbers and what they wanted to talk about is how could they make their businesses more profitable. And they said, surely we could use machines. And nobody really said that before. And so they invented the loom and the spinning jenny. They talked about getting a, a machine which could pump water out of the mines, and they tried to do that with steam. And eventually they created the steam engine. <coughs> and that was the beginning of technology. And it was rather like letting off uh, an explosion on a mountain, which causes a huge avalanche down the mountainside. And the avalanche of technology has been going on ever since. And every year it gets faster, <coughs> it gets more money, it gets more momentum. And so people say, this avalanche of technology which is constantly accelerating and getting bigger, is it going to stop at some time? Well, as we look at the collection of technologies, which we don't know what, how to use them, we don't know what to do with them, uh, th things like quantum entanglement, for example, it's quite clear that certainly not for the next 200 years. So this avalanche, absolute avalanche of technology that started here and has led to a stage where things are out of control here is going to go on at least for another two centuries with technology getting wilder and more powerful and stranger because just about anything to do with quantum mechanics is totally counterintuitive. And so people are now beginning to say, why? Why have we got technologies which are totally contrary to human common sense, totally counterintuitive. And the answer to that is our common sense is based on the windows we've got here, the things we can see and hear. Our whole brain thinks in three dimensions. It can't think about <coughs> ten-dimensional string theory. And so as we look at the, uh, the, the things which we feel we need to have to understand cosmology, uh, to understand the Big Bang, to understand quantum mechanics, to understand quantum entanglement and so on, those things are totally, they totally defy human common sense. So the future of science, to a large extent, is something which defies human common sense. But you can build computer models of it which enable you to do calculations and mathematics which say if only you get this right then extraordinary things are going to happen. And uh, uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with quantum entanglement, but when quantum entanglement was, was first understood, people said, well, that's a, an interesting theory, <coughs> but it's of no practical value. We can't really use it for anything that's useful. 
just near to where I live. I've got a home in Vermont, and there's, uh, it's, you know, it's a very rural district indeed, and there's one house there which looks like a typical Vermonter. You might think that a, a farmer lives there, and the guy's got a, a, a clean room in his basement. The image of a, a Victorian inventor was that he got a workshop in his basement. Well, this guy's got a $50 million clean room in his basement. And the reason it's so expensive is that the telephone industry pretty much went bankrupt in 2002, and he managed to buy the clean room from one of the telephone companies in a bankruptcy sale. And he's doing lots of work uh, in that clean room on nanotechnology and other things like that, which, uh, for which he gets extremely large contracts from the Department of Defense and other, other such places. And he's working on quantum entanglement, and he's saying, look, one of the incredibly important things is to understand how the, the brain works. And we can photograph the brain in MRI, uh, fMRI, but the problem is, when we photograph the brain, we interfere with the way it's thinking. And is there any way in which you could photograph the brain without interrupting its thinking? So that we can get a, a dynamic image of what happens when we're listening to music, for example. And he's built a camera in which he fires a beam of subatomic particles into the head, and they're so small they don't interfere with the thinking at all. You just don't know they're there. And then he's got another device which is 20 feet away, and this is a quantum entanglement device where he's using quantum entanglement to be able to uh, try to identify the things which are happening in the human brain. So all, all of these things which begin by starting to look so abstract we can't use them, <laughs> sooner or later we get practical applications. Anyway, the Industrial Revolution caused this avalanche and it will go on thundering down the mountainside getting bigger and bigger. And uh, this uh, caused, this is the curve of population. Population was growing quite slowly for a long time. When I was at college, it was 2 billion. Now it's 6.5 billion. And the demographers are saying it's going to go to 9 billion before it slows down. So that's population. Now here's uh, technology. Huge uh, explosive growth in technology being part of the end of the 20th century. And one uh, technology was communications. So the use of fiber optics gives us the capability to build extreme bandwidth in uh, telecommunications. We'll also get extreme bandwidth in wireless uh, communications. In um, Vermont, my home in Vermont, I live on top of a mountain and they said, look, this is the perfect relay station. Could we use your house to uh, be a relay station for the internet, for the whole valley here? And so I said, well, what do I get out of that? He said, well, I'll give you free. I'll give you a free channel. So I'm going to get a, uh, an internet connection, which is 70 million bits per second, free of charge in the, in the house. And so the big question becomes, what can you do with 70 million bits per second? I think what we are going to need, almost as a standard all over the world, television is, is changing, and high-definition television is a set of standards which are just wonderful. High-definition. It's just beautiful if you're a filmmaker or you're making television. And it really doesn't make sense to make film now, you know, with celluloid. You go into a typical film projection room, it's got these awful big machines for getting uh, celluloid film thundering through them. And of course, it ought to be totally digital uh, and transmitted to the movie theater. And it should be high definition. The film which we showed last night in the um, museum was the, the film of, of the subject which we're talking about now. And that was high definition. And it looks beautiful on a very large screen. And you really don't need much that's larger than that. So I think high definition is going to be the standard for television for the next 30 years or so. And we won't want anything better than that until television becomes virtual reality. And that's going to cause us to need all sorts of things which are a different type of bandwidth. Anyway, uh, communication is exploding. <coughs> Consumerism in which you want to, to buy no end of goods, so the consumer pattern of, of America becoming very strong indeed. Anyway, all of these things grow and the population is so large, soil all over the planet is being turned into desert, fresh water is running out, um, the forests are being destroyed all over the planet, and it's the same pattern. The population is getting too large and our demand for goods and services are getting too large. Uh, the oceans will be devoid of life unless we take appropriate action in the next 20 years or so. And with just about all of these things, uh, we, we'd make that phrase, the, the next 20 years. The film is narrated by Michael Douglas, and the opening uh, phrase he uses, Michael Douglas is absolutely wonderful to work with, absolutely superb professional. And the uh, sentence he uses at the beginning is, we are an extraordinary crossroads in human history. Our actions or failures to act during the next 20 years will determine the fate of the earth and human civilization for centuries 
to come. And that really is a statement about how important this time is, this 20 years, and how important the 21st century is, and how important it is that we should get people to understand what we're talking about here and find solutions to the problems which we are talking about. India and China are growing just furiously. Both India and China will soon be larger than the United States. And I don't think the civilization in China or the civilization in India will be really like the civilization in the United States. It will be different from here. But they'll become quite huge. Uh, China's 1.3 billion now, and probably it might go up to 1.5 billion. And the reason I'd say that is because the Chinese think that anybody who's Chinese, no matter where they are on the planet, th their real home is China. And if you count all the Chinese on the planet, it's about 1.5 billion. Uh, India is about 1.1 billion now, but it's uh, got a fertility rate which is much, much higher than China. So 20 years from now, the population of India will be larger than the population of China. And together, they'll get up to close to 3 billion people 20, 30 years from now. So huge, huge population. And their economy is growing very fast indeed. And uh, China, the, um, the Department of Defense in China is probably going to be larger than the American Department of Defense. 30, almost certainly 30 years from now, maybe larger, 20, 20 years from now. So what is China going to do when it gets nuclear weapons and, and uh, extreme biological weapons? And this is a, a very interesting question about the future, which we should ask now. Somebody ask you a question, Ben. Because in the U.S., I believe they spend roughly 10, 10 times fewer dollars of if that than the U.S. Are you counting bodies? Yes. So... Uh, in the future. In the future. Because in dollar terms, are pretty much negligible today. Yeah, it raises all sorts of complicated questions about the U.S. economy because and I think Walmart is, is fascinating. Walmart used to have the American flag all over the place and say, we're the biggest American employer. Everybody we employ is American, very patriotic uh, company. 98% of everybody that they employ now is Chinese. And so I, I've been in the software business all, all my life. And uh, it really got into a, a crisis around about 2000 or so because it became clear that the Indian software was better than than uh, American software. And software is something you can measure. And I've always been very interested in measurements, you know, dollars per function point, number of errors per function point, uh, productivity in software development, reliability of software, and so on. These are all things you can measure. And American software, uh, in most of my working life, was far the best in the world. This was the country that invented the best techniques in software development, and Microsoft was very strongly part of that. And here, all of a sudden, all of these measures started to look better with Indian software than with American software. And so Microsoft moved much of its software production to India, and I was running a relatively small company, and we simply weren't going to survive unless we uh, moved into India. And so we uh, looked at 80 Indian companies, did a detailed due diligence of 80 Indian companies, and picked one of them. And then all of the management consultants who advised us said, don't have a partnership with them, don't uh, have the usual types of relationship. There's only one thing which will work in the long run, and that is buy them outright and make it American. Then you solve the visa problems. And everybody said, don't worry about that because they're no good at management. You know, you just, uh, it's programming that they're good at. And so you'll be buying all the programmers, and that's what we did, and it enabled the company to survive and, and now to do very well. But in order to do it, we had to put an Indian CEO on the board, uh, the CEO of the Indian company, and so there were about three Indians which had to be put on the board. And uh, two years down the road, they'd fired the American CEO and uh, the CFO, so now the Indians run the whole show. And, and the Indians, are, at least in this small company, are simply much better top executives, much better uh, high-level managers than the Americans were. And so this is the, the way the world is changing. And India is changing in a very different way from China. In India set up things like MIT, he called them IIT, Indian Institute of Technology. And the first one turned out to be extremely successful, so then it set up six. And all six of them turned out utterly brilliant people and were very successful indeed. And the reason why they can be so brilliant and um, brilliant in programming is, you know, a, a company can, uh, in India, you couldn't do this here, can hire a thousand people, and like the Marines, they'll say, only some of you are going to pass the courses. So the thousand people in our present intake, 900 will be out of here. 
uh, six months from now. Now, do you want to be one of the 10% that remains? And they work like hell, and the brightest ones become the members of the company, and so this is why they're creating such good software. You've got this filtering mechanism for filtering out the very best people in India. And uh, anyway, that has happened, and there's six uh, MITs, if you will, Indian MITs work very well, so now they're building 30 Indian MITs. Now, China is completely different. China decided it wanted to be the factory of the world. And so it's training people to, in manufacturing and it's getting into all the, all the Walmart business and other types of things. So uh, some people say China and India are heading in the same direction and really they're, they're not. They're very different from what is happening here. In China we worry about China because it is uh, growing so fast it's opening up one new power station per week. And those are typically two billion watts, huge, huge power stations. And they're almost all coal, and the Chinese coal is filthy coal. It's one of the filthiest coal on the planet. And if the Chinese go, go on doing that, then the Chinese are going to have a huge effect in wrecking the uh, climate <coughs> of the planet. So there's lots of dialogue which is going on with the Chinese now saying, how can we change this uh, situation? But the fascinating thing is if China decided that it wanted to save the planet, it could say, look, we'll be the country that produces non-petroleum cars. We'll be the country that sells enormous quantities of non-petroleum cars to the whole world. If you want to buy a wind generator, then you buy a Chinese wind generator. We can make five megawatt wind generators. We've got about 60 different technologies for solar panels in the future, and we don't know which one is going to be best, but we do know that solar technology is going to be a fraction of the cost of today's solar technology. So suppose that uh, China then uh, did all of that and made all the types of goods that would be the ecologically friendly goods, then China could turn from the, the country which is destroying the planet today to being the country which is saving the planet by creating all of these types of uh, goods. And China can't possibly get the, um, the electricity it needs, the power that it needs, without uh, having a very large amount of nuclear uh, power. So, so nuclear power is very important to China. Now, a very important thing to say about nuclear power is that almost all the power stations we've got today were built at the same time as Chernobyl. And so people talk about proven nuclear technology. Well, the only proven nuclear technology is like Chernobyl because we haven't built anything until recently. So France has got the, the lowest footprint, the lowest ecological footprint of any country, any people on, on the planet. And it's because uh, more than 80% of its electricity is generated by nuclear power. So no carbon going into the atmosphere. But the nuclear power stations of France are light to noble. Now the important thing to say is that the technology of nuclear power has changed incredibly. And today we'd use the term fourth generation, Chernobyl second generation. And you know, you think of a second generation airplane, a DC-3, compare it with a Boeing 777, huge difference. Well, it's the same with nuclear power. So we've moved on to much more advanced nuclear power stations. And so that's very, very critical to the changes that are happening in, in China. Anyway, uh, human behavior in all sorts of different ways is exceeding what the Earth can support. And so you've got all of these rising curves, changing very fast. And so what this really means is that we've got to find solutions to these problems. And most of the solutions are not difficult. Uh, and so the Industrial Revolution really needs to have a corresponding revolution, 21st century revolution, if you like, which is saying this unleashed the capability to have the lifestyle we've got today, the capability for us to have cars and air conditioning and, and the food that we eat and so on. But we've now got to get a, a corresponding revolution. And one of the characteristics that so this revolution must be that it doesn't lower the quality of life at all. In fact, it raises the quality of life but it enables us to have a higher quality of life without damaging the environment. And so one of the terms I like to use is eco-affluent. <coughs> eco-affluent means you've got a, a, an affluent lifestyle. Wonderful lifestyle. In fact, much more wonderful than today. All sorts of things you can do with new, new technology and, and uh, new, new types of jobs and so on. But while these give you a fascinating lifestyle and all sorts of interesting things, they don't damage the ecology. They are eco-affluent. And so this revolution, part of that is a change in civilization to being an eco-affluent civilization. And um, now if all goes well and we do what we're describing here, then we can have an absolutely magnificent future. The uh, change in human beings, the change in uh, quality of life uh, this century, if we do the right things, is going to be enormous. 
And so one of the huge problems of this century is you've got all of the, the, the technology, all the wonderful new things that we've got. How do you make people happy with that? How do you make people satisfied? How do you make people creative? Uh, are we going to build a civilization that's su a superbly creative civilization? I think so. And if that happens, then we've got a magnificent future. But if it goes badly, and we don't control the, the Chinese building, you know, two gigawatts per week of coal, power stations, we do pump so much carbon into the atmosphere that we wreck the basic control mechanisms of the Earth. This is what it's really all about. The, the Earth is incredibly complex and it's got control mechanisms, which were first described by James Lovelock 30 years ago. And he referred to them as Gaia. Gaia being the set of control mechanisms which control the Earth's climate. And we are now doing things which are going to wreck Gaia, wreck the mechanisms which control the climate. And that's very dangerous. And so we want to make sure that we understand that and take corrective actions before we get to a point of no return where the climate is really going to get totally out of control. So, very important part of what we're talking about here. Anyway, this is a transition, really unique in human history, in which we're saying we've got to change our, our way of life in many important ways so that the 22nd century can be magnificent. So you're going to get the technology continuing to grow and, and change uh, for centuries, maybe many centuries in the future, but you now know that you must do that in such a way that we have a great civilization, we don't wreck the climate, we don't destroy the oceans, we don't uh, create weapons of mass destruction which are totally uncontrolled. We find some way of uh, having a dialogue with the extreme Muslims to say, uh, you may have very different views to our own, but if you translate those views into weapons of mass destruction, then it's going to be a new dark ages. So uh, how, do we, how do we get these things under control? This is what our kids have got to deal with. So the T generation has got to come to grips with those uh, types of problems. Yeah? How far do we fall back in your um, idea of a dark age? What does that look like? Have you seen the film um, Children of Men? You've already seen the film Children of Men? Sure. Well, imagine that as being a portrait of the future. So the whole of America, the whole planet looks like the, the background of ch Children of Men. I know I'd describe that as a new dark age. Um, how far can we fall back? Well, we could fall back, you know, <coughs> like Iraq today, in which you've got uh, the terror, you've got uh, lack of reason, you've got people uh, wanting to blow up things in, in the cities uh, everywhere. You've got uh, anti-technology terrorists wanting to destroy Microsoft. You've got uh, people wanting to, you've got ecological terrorists who, who want to uh, destroy anything that puts carbon into the atmosphere and so on. You get the sort of madness in society. Now this is what I'd call a, a new dark age. Now how do you avoid that? Well, you want to find uh, uh, ways to educate people on what is happening. You want to find solutions. You want to get a new generation of kids where, where you say, if you get it right, it's going to be absolutely magnificent. If you get it right, your life's going to be wonderful. But you've got to learn that these are the things which we have got to avoid doing. <laughs> Do you see pulling the billions out of shanty cities as part of this pivotal century? Yeah, one of the, the things which uh, it's almost difficult for the first world to understand today is the first world is about a billion people, a bit less than a billion people. But we've got about three billion people on the planet that live on less than two dollars a day. Uh, how do you live on two dollars a day? You've got about a billion people that live on less than one dollar a day. And so these people lead terrible lives. Now, uh, we've learned an awful lot about uh, human uh, DNA and how DNA changes things. And one of the things that we now know is that the DNA of the starving, terribly, uh, ter people with terrible lives in the, in the shanty towns is the same as our DNA. And uh, so all over the world, people create geniuses. And there's a, some books that have been written which say probably about one in 500 humans is going to be a genius. And some of the great geniuses don't have a high IQ. Mozart didn't have a very high IQ. Picasso had a fairly low IQ. So um, several of the great, many of the great geniuses um, 
a fairly low IQ. So there's not a direct correlation between genius and high IQ. Now, of course, some geniuses, Stephen Hawking, have got an unbelievable IQ. You know, Stephen Hawking can come up with uh, mathematics theories in his head which change cosmology, where it takes the scientists with supercomputers six months to check his theories. Uh, and what they find out is, Christ, Stephen Hawking was right. You know, how on earth can he come up with theories like that? So at the top end, you've got the most incredible uh, IQ in the genius of the world. And uh, anyway, the meaning of the 21st century is this huge transition. We're, we're doing things which exceed the capacity of the planet and therefore we've got to correct that. So the industrial revolution's got to have a corresponding revolution, 21st century revolution. We need to understand that as well as possible. And we need to teach it to the T generation, teach it to our kids, teach it to young people everywhere. And so your children will be the generation that brings about this massive transition. They need to be prepared for it. And this avalanche of technology thundering down the mountainside is going to get faster every year. It's going to get more momentum every year. And uh, uh, most scientists think that that won't stop in the 21st century. It probably won't stop in the 22nd or 23rd century. We don't know when it will stop. But uh, there's so many things in science today where we haven't a clue really what they mean or what to do with them. But it's like, you know, Faraday inventing electricity. They're, they're going to lead to things which uh, change our way of life and change, change society. And uh, Lord Rees, the president of the Royal Society in London, uh, every uh, scientist in, in uh, Europe would like to have the initials FRS after his name, Fellow of the Royal Society. And he's written a book uh, called Our Final Century in which he said the chance of civilization, in fact the chance of humanity surviving the 21st century is only about 50%. So we have things which could destroy Homo sapiens uh, as well as destroying civilization. And so we've got to take that very seriously and look what he's talking about and then say, uh, you know, how, how do you react to that? And 50-50 chance that humanity will survive. How do I react to that? There's only one right way to react to it and say we've absolutely got to make that false. We've got to understand what he's talking about and do everything possible to make absolutely sure there's no way that Homo sapiens is going to be wiped out in this century. And there's no way that we're going to destroy civilization in this century. So very, very important uh, aspect of what we're talking about. So eventually we've got to uh, control technology's avalanche or it will uh, destroy us. And uh, 21st century technologies, extreme bandwidth in internet, which I'm thought, sure you guys are all thinking about, and uh, nanotechnology, very important, uh, changing all sorts of things, all sorts of products. Uh, it's, it's, it's interesting to make the comment that the largest fortunes are probably going to be made out of the smallest components as we go through the nanotechnology era. A, uh, a, a nanometer is the distance that your fingernail grows in one second. It's very tiny indeed. And so one of the characteristics of nanotechnology products is you can't see them you know, with, with the human eye. You can't even see them with an optical microscope. So they're very, very tiny indeed. We've, we've made threads of uh, long um, carbon nanotubes where we can uh, weave the threads together, like, rather like making a rope, by weaving uh, um, hemp together. And that rope of uh, nanotubes becomes something you can't see. You can't even see it with an optical microscope. But it can pick up a 10-ton truck. And uh, this, this already exists in the technology. And carbon nanotubes are going to have a huge effect on your job because we can uh, get a, a carbon nanotube which is uh, minute compared with today's transistors and put the equivalent of 10,000 uh, logic gates into one, one nanotube. And so people have argued about, you know, is Moore's law going to stop? Is, is it possible that we can go on doubling the amount of memory on a chip every uh, 18 months for a long time in the future? And when people are looking at silicon, they would say, no, Moore's law is going to end. It's going to wind down. But if you look at nanotechnology, absolutely not. Uh, almost certainly for the next 60 years, we're going to continue to double the amount of information that we can put on a chip and the amount of logic that we can put on a chip. But it won't be uh, silicon like today. It will be uh, uh, nanotechnology, uh, which means we've got to absolutely radically change the manufacturing processes. And the manufacturing processes of today's uh, silicon, of which Intel perhaps is, is the best in, in the world, Intel is now talking about components, which are 10 nanometers on a relatively conventional uh, silicon chip. 
but ultimately it's going to be different technology, which will be the technology of uh, carbon nanotubes. There are lots of different types of carbon nanotubes. I went to a, a conference in Russia in, uh, with nuclear scientists who were concerned mainly with fusion and uh, uh, you know, out, out, uh, out outside limits of plasma technology, but there was one guy there who uh, knew all the mathematics of nanotubes. And I thought there were two or three different types of nanotubes. He said, no, there's an almost infinite number of nanotubes. And showed, showed the mathematics and the different types of nanotubes lead to different properties. If you want to get nanotubes, which you've got the, the largest amount of memory you can put on a chip, it's one type of technology. If you want to nanotubes for different functions, it's quite different. So a huge number of different combinations of carbon atoms that we can put together in, into nanotubes. The Russians are, 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 are very curious. They're probably the best mathematicians in the world. Their science has been utterly destroyed by the collapse of the USSR. Uh, many of the world's most brilliant scientists are Russian scientists, and they're absolutely scared of retiring. They, they get no income after retirement. And so there's all sorts of um, games going on where the uh, Russian scientists who are so brilliant and scared of retirement of trying to get together with Americans who will write grants that will enable them to get huge amounts of government, American government funding for the things that they're doing. So this conference was all about that to a large extent. Superintelligent uh, computing and uh, some people say that uh, when computers become ultra-intelligent, you won't be able to tell the difference between a computer and a human being. I think that is absolute nonsense. I'd like to know your views on it, because it's uh, your profession. I think that uh, when we get uh, ultra-intelligent computing, the intelligence which is useful will be utterly unlike human intelligence, quite different from human intelligence. And so um, 20, 20 years from now, we'll get very intelligent computers indeed, but they won't be anything like humans. They'll be fundamentally different. And that's probably a good thing. And the people who work for Goldman Sachs will know how to use human intelligence to communicate with computer intelligence so they can make vast amounts of money out of that. It's an interesting and new ways of using computers and intelligence. Are you familiar with the company Renaissance? Well, Renaissance is a money manager company, a hedge fund company. And they have found ways of getting computers to detect patterns, which humans couldn't possibly detect. And the, uh, the chief of uh, Renaissance gets a fee, <coughs> a small fee. Now, if he increases a customer's investment uh, by 10%, then he gets a very small, small amount of that. Well, his earnings in 2006 for managing customers' money was $1.8 billion. That was his fee. And all of that fee came from using computers with the type of intelligence that humans don't have, the capability to recognize patterns that humans can't uh, recognize. So, interesting world we're building. So non-human-like intelligence, a very important uh, technology which I think is going to go on changing throughout the century. Uh, evolution. Darwin, when you look at the, uh, the stuff Darwin talks about, it's an algorithm. And if it's an algorithm, we can create Darwinism in the laboratory. We can create Darwinism in software. And so we've got quite a lot of experiments now with the automated evolution of chips, automated evolution of software, automated evolution of networks, automated evolution of the production process in very complex factories, for example. So I, I think automated evolution is going to be a very important subject. Uh, anyway, other, other things that we've got on the uh, list here. Synthetic biology is uh, fascinating. We now have the capability to put together synthetically uh, creatures, which are live creatures, where we design the creature. And uh, today they're very simple creatures. Uh, much of it's being done by Craig Venter. Craig Venter has created a lot of new um, types of um, biological creature. And they might be very useful. For example, he thinks he can create biological creatures which, which generate hydrogen. So imagine a huge amount of uh, biological stuff in the vat which is creating hydrogen uh, which, which then relates to the car we drive in the future. And uh, quantum entanglement, tra transhumanism, we'll say a bit more about that later on. And that really is the transformation of human beings into something which is different from the human beings which we have today. And I think the 21st century will lead us through transhumanism, which in the beginning it's things which we don't really object to. We have uh, techniques for uh, making us healthier, making us have longer lives, for stopping cancer, catching cancer early. And uh, then we find that many of these techniques enable us to enhance our senses, 
your eyes get pretty fuzzy when you're my age, and it's quite clear now that we have techniques with which we can have a, the eye of a hundred-year-old person being like the eye of a five-year-old. And so techniques which relate to medicine, but then we go on beyond that to create intelligence, which is different from other people's intelligence, and create their senses, where we have different senses from the, the five human senses. And so, as you follow through the things which are going to happen as we try to improve the human being, it leads you into a whole set of um, ethical questions about are we going to create a sort of super race which is different from the non-modified human being? And almost certainly we are. So, a lot of interesting questions. Freeman Dyson has a wonderful phrase uh, in his book, uh, his books, he talks about things being infinite in all directions. And if you look at quantum entanglement, the consequences of that are sort of infinite in all directions. And in fact, everything we've got on that list with a slight exaggeration, I would use the phrase infinite in all directions to describe these changes in, in technology. So good news, um, every problem we can describe, the big problems on the world have got solutions. Global wealth will increase uh, enormously over the um, last 10 years or so. The American economy has grown by roughly 3%. Uh, uh, GDP per capita has gone up by roughly 3% uh, per year. And it may not do quite as well as that as we look at the rest of the century. If we said 2.5%, uh, probably it will do 2.5% or better than that. If it does 2.5%, that means that America will be 12 times richer in real terms by the end of the century from what it is at the beginning of the century. So huge new capability for wealth generation. So a lot of kids say, you know, it's all bad news. We've got global warming, we've got terrorism, we've got all of the bad things you talk about, the destroying the fish in the oceans and so on. Well, at the same time, we've got the capability to generate enormous wealth. China, at the end of the century, will be between 20 and 30 times richer than China today in real terms. Uh, what's China going to do with that? What sort of civilization is it going to build? But anyway, that's part of the good news. Uh, most of the new technology will be clean, miniaturized. Nanotechnology will be very important. We'll get away from smokestack industries. We'll have cars which don't use carbon-based fuel. And we will have technologies which almost uh, everywhere stop putting the huge amount of carbon into the atmosphere. So if you look at the set of technologies by 40 years from now, all of the technologies which are causing big problems today are likely to have been uh, tra transformed. But the problem is, before we get to that stage of clean industry, clean technologies, m miniaturized industry and so on, we may um, wreck the planet with today's technologies um, if we don't do something to stop it. And uh, so probably many different types of civilization in the 21st century. Bad news, well, well nightmares. And so here I've got a, a list of 12 uh, nightmares, the, the, me the mega problems, the biggest problems of the century. Severe climate change, excessive population growth, excessive population growth might not matter if they lived like they live today, but there's no way they're going to live like today. If you've got nine billion people on the planet, sooner or later they want, they're going to want to live like Americans. And if you try to stop them living like Americans, they're going to shoot their way into the system. And so far too larger population. Uh, water running out. The Green Revolution totally depended upon water and most of that water was underground in huge underground lakes which we call aquifers and uh, much of that water got there a million years ago you know in past ice ages so you got huge amounts of water. You, you pump it up and you taste it and uh, uh, you think it's going to taste like very fresh water. It tastes like distilled water. It's got no taste. <coughs> it's been there for a very long time. Now, this was uh, the basis, to a large extent, of the Green Revolution in creating food for the planet. And many of those aquifers are now close to running out of water. Uh, we've given people that water free. We haven't monitored the aquifer. We haven't put any instrumentation in the aquifer. And so we've destroyed this incredibly valuable resource. So there are going to be wars over water. At the same time, we've destroyed much of the soil on the planet. Uh, much of Africa used to have soil which was four feet deep, topsoil, four feet deep. You fly over Africa on a small plane now, and in much of Africa there's no topsoil at all. There's a desert spreading. And in much of Africa, the topsoil is so thin you can see through the topsoil to the rocks underneath it. So we've destroyed, to a large extent, the topsoil of the planet. 
And uh, so farm shortages, food shortages, big problem. Destruction of the oceans, which I mentioned, failed nations <coughs> like Zimbabwe. Uh, famines, uh, uh, triage, which means that we say we can uh, do a great job in saving third world nations like Brazil and making them work very well, but we can't do a damn thing about Zimbabwe. So we are oh, really without thinking about it, building a, a new type of globalism, which is corporations everywhere <coughs> are pretty much run by computers, totally dependent on computers. And the computers are linked in real time to computers in other countries, other corporations. If you look at Nissan, for example, Nissan is making cars, and it's beautifully automated production line with no end of robots there, changes the mix constantly. So the, the mix of types of cars is changing, and the components arrive just in time on that production line, and the components come from the cheapest place on the planet. So they're buying components from Brazil, they're buying components from China, and so on, and they arrive just in time and this needs incredibly sophisticated software to create the uh, just-in-time global mechanisms. Now, those mechanisms apply to countries that are capable of handling the software and are capable of managing the extreme complexity of something like that. And of the people who can do that today, it's probably about three billion people on in, in the planet. And, so uh, Africa, there's no country in Africa which could be part of that new type of globalism with the exception of South Africa. And South Africa is like America in many ways. And you go into the BMW factory in South Africa and you, you find one car being made by six robots. <laughs> incredibly complicated and the goods arriving just in time in, in BMW. BMW applying, a, a, uh, employing and educating a large number of black people, setting up uh, universities, setting up road systems into its factory. So they change the whole community uh, where they exist. Uh, so the people in that community are taken care of and are well educated and so on. So this is part of the, the good aspect of global business. The bad aspect is that if you're in a country like Zimbabwe, there's no way under the sun that you will be part of the components for Nissan Motors. So this is a, a triage. Without us expecting it, uh, we are saying that something like three billion people live in countries which cannot be part of this new type of globalism. This new type of globalism is making big profits and big money, but it's automatically harming the poorest countries of the world. Religious extremism, weapons of mass destruction, terrorism with atomic weapons, <coughs> war that could become so bad that it uh, ends uh, civilization. And uh, the um, Lord Rees uh, existential risks, meaning te technology which could uh, suddenly go wrong so that it could uh, de destroy Homo sapiens. For example, nuclear physicists want to build bigger colliders, big, bigger atom smashers. And the, an extraordinary thing has happened to America under the Bush administration. And that is all money for nuclear physicists who are experts on um, subatomic particles and need the biggest possible atom smashers have, been, have had their budgets cut. And uh, so there's, there's every single nuclear accelerator, this is incredible, every single nuclear accelerator in America has either closed or will close in the next couple of years. And the physicists who work on that stuff have got a very specialized set of intellectual knowledge, and so they're leaving America to go to CERN in Switzerland or to other places where those things are opening. Anyway, the next really big change is going to be the Large Hadron Collider in CERN. And that's about uh, 20 miles across. You have to have a passport to go around the whole ring. Part of it's in France and part of it's in uh, Switzerland. And the idea there is to take the heaviest atoms, like gold, <coughs> accelerate them up to close the speed of light, smash them into each other. And when you smash them into each other, you get an incre incredibly complex debris of uh, subatomic particles. You don't want to uh, study those subatomic particles. And almost certainly you're going to find some particles that we don't know anything about today. Now, when we've done that, they'll then want to build the next generation. They call it Next. And after they've built that, and people are designing Next today, you want to go beyond that and call build the generation after that, which they call Next Next, and so on. Now, that's Hadron, which is a heavy particle. We want to do the same with very light particles, like electrons and uh, neutrons. And uh, so there's a, a quite different activity. Now, with the light particles, which are called leptons, we want something which is about 30 miles long, 
and we want to accelerate things up the speed of light and smash them into each other. So Germany has produced a place where you can build uh, a collider of that type in absolutely dead straight line, <coughs> which is in, in Germany 30 kilometers, not 30 miles long. Uh, we were certainly going to to get uh, ones which are much bigger than 30 kilometers, but we couldn't do it in places which are heavily built up there. So probably the third world is going to be the only place where we can create things in a dead straight line which are, say, 500 miles long, which is what they're going to want. Now, the thing which some of the um, theoretical physicists worry about is, <coughs> is that as you do that, as you get these uh, particles colliding, you don't really know what's going to happen. And uh, there's a extremely complicated mathematics relating to it, but you might create something now which is almost like the Big Bang. In fact, you could accidentally start another Big Bang, or you could do something which sets fire to the atmosphere and spreads around the Earth. And so this is one of the things that uh, Lord Rees worries about, quite a lot of other things like that, uh, in which he's saying science is going to get so complicated we you know, just don't really know what's going to happen. And if you've got a, a collider which uh, was too dangerous, then you could uh, wreck the Earth with it. So are we going to put controls on the building of future colliders? And, and Lord Rees would say, absolutely yes, we've got to. There are certain doors which must not be opened, he says. And then I got an inter interview Friedman Dyson, a great physicist, and he says, um, because thou art virtuous, may I have no cakes and ale. And he's saying, set any rules you want, and I'm going to disobey them, because there are experiments which I think are important, and you are not going to stop me doing those experiments. So this, this is one of the concerns. Anyway, the, uh, a set of uh, nightmares uh, like that had many trends which we can predict, because they have got extreme momentum. Here's some, some of the bad news uh, trends. Um, de destroying the topsoil, destroying the, putting too much CO2 into the atmosphere and so on. Water, water is um, fa fascinating on this list here. Um, if you look at the aquifers, the amount of water which we're taking and not replacing is about 150 tons per year. And if you translate that into a convoy of water trucks, it would be a convoy of water trucks which is 300,000 miles long every day that's how much water we're taking and not replacing. And that's 37 times the diameter of the Earth here. And so obviously this can't go on. And uh, so what, what's going to stop it? Well, we're suddenly going to find one country after another, one farming area after another, coming to a crunch in which the, the water which they think they're going to have is, is going to run out. And they won't have water. So this is one of the serious problems of the uh, planet. Is there a solution to it? Absolutely, there's a solution to it. Everywhere we look, you're wasting water. You look at uh, <coughs> Seattle, it rains here, and the water just runs down the drain, runs into the streets, runs back into the sea. And all over the world, there's an incredible amount of rainwater, and 98% of the rainwater is wasted. It's, it's just thrown away. Well, if we could have a, a rule or, or a way of behaving where we capture most of that rainwater, now, I live in an island off Bermuda, it's uh, offshore in Bermuda, and when I bought this island, there was nothing growing on it because the soil just got washed into the sea. But you look at the island today, and it's got the most lush vegetation. It's like a tropical garden and homes on it, and uh, we live very well there. We bathe, bathe in fresh water, and we drink fresh water, and so on. And <coughs> the reason for that is that we save every bit of rainwater, now, I can't live, I can't use any water apart from rainwater. I don't have a desalination plant, and there's no way I can get rainwater other than rainwater. So we've had to organize everything on the island. So all the plants that are growing have got computers which uh, uh, have got drip irrigation, which is taking water to the roots of the plant, exactly the right amount of water at the right time to those plants. And so this is extreme efficiency in the use of rainwater. Now, I go all over, all over the world to water stress parts of the world, and they're not doing that. And so everywhere you look, farmers in places that are going to run out of water, they haven't even thought about extreme water efficiency. And so, uh, yeah, this is absolutely a solvable problem. <coughs> We're going to have to solve it or we'll starve. And so you've got to put the rules and regulations, the controls, the mechanisms, the computer control, drip irrigation systems and so on, into place. So all the problems we're talking about here are problems with solutions. These are the freight train trends. So excessive population growth, depletion of the Earth's resources, uh, uh, growing holes in the ozone layer, growing spread of terrorism and so on. 
and uh, so all of those fit together <coughs> and they all affect each other so you've got to understand the whole picture and when you do understand the whole picture it's, it's clear that we're in fairly deep trouble and so this is something that we need to teach to younger generation. Well you probably know all about global warming so why don't I stop uh, talking about uh, global warming. The, it's interesting that the insurance industries now <coughs> are doing very detailed, the actuaries are doing very detailed modeling of category 6 hurricanes. There's never been a category 6 hurricane. There's only been about uh, 8 uh, category 5 hurricanes. The island I was just describing unfortunately had a category 5 hurricane and I was on the island throughout the whole thing and the average wind speed was 150 miles per hour and it, it gusted up to 175 miles per hour. Trees travel horizontally when you've got winds at that sort of speed and uh, so devastating hurricane but nothing was really broken on the island and the reason is I built a house, the house has got lots of glass in it sort of modern architecture which looks very nice. In a place like that you want lots of glass because you've got wonderful views so I got the fences, where every fence was glass fence without, without posts there and this glass was stressed for winds of 200 miles per hour and the, the architect was with us when we went through the category 5 hurricane he nearly had a nervous breakdown but when we walked around the next day not one single piece of glass had broken so once again you've got solutions. If we have category 6 hurricanes we can build cities and homes which are perfectly safe in a category 6 hurricane. We can but think of the shanty towns, think of the people who uh, live in the very poor parts of the world, their shacks are going to just be swept away in a category 6 hurricane. And anyway, now the important thing about these nightmares, if I skip, why don't I try and skip right to the end of the, the session now um, and say so for each of these problems there is a solution. So this is all about the solutions. And so in the film, fairly early in the film, it lists the 12 nightmares and uh, then at the end of the film it comes back to the 12 nightmares and says look for each of these nightmares there are, are solutions they're very different in their nature and uh, severe climate change we need the world ecology to be tightly managed really understood with very sophisticated computer models and we need to have laws which cause us to take the right actions about putting carbon into the atmosphere and other things which affect the world uh, climate and the uh, same with ocean destruction. We need to uh, tightly manage the oceans. So absolutely every fishing boat has got GPS and you've got a central computer which knows about every fishing boat. There are regulations about what the fishing boat is allowed to do. Good question. Can I just start all of your uh, things here are global in nature. Yes. Uh, we don't live in a global, globally right. governed right. globe. Right. How would, and you, that's, how would you uh, resolve that? You okay, that's the crunch issue. All of these are global. And all of those 12 uh, problems could not be solved by America because they're global problems. So you've got to get global cooperation in order to solve these things. Now today, I, I would describe today as an era of the most brilliant management in history. <coughs> most brilliant management ever. <coughs> the management of Microsoft, the management of Starbucks, we've got no end of corporations that are just superbly managed in different ways, a lot of brilliant management in China and uh, India but all of that brilliant management is being applied to things which can make a profit being applied to corporations like Microsoft and none of the brilliant management is being applied to, to, to these questions so somehow we've got to go through a transition in which we learn how to manage global situations and we learn how to apply brilliant management to, to global issues. Air traffic control is incredibly complex and in any part of the world if you get a, a, a plane that fails then you've got to reschedule many other planes. You've got to reschedule planes not from one airline but many airlines. You've got to reschedule the crews so the amount of computation that has to go on in order to make traffic control, air traffic control work is incredible. Now that's global. It's a global problem and these global treaties it needs uh, separate countries <coughs> to, to agree about how you do it. And so you can find examples of uh, globalism, global problems which have been solved by brilliant management. And so what I'm saying is really we've got to put that type of management into place for all of the issues here. And air traffic control is much more difficult than saving the oceans. That's relatively simple uh, thing to do. It's just that you've got to have the international cooperation, you've got to have the political will. With almost all of these problems we can say the political will is not there today. 
and you can't really solve them unless you put the political will there. How do you get the political will into place? Well, you've got to get the public understanding the nature. Now, the public are beginning to understand global warming now. Al Gore's film had a huge effect on that. And uh, uh, as, as they begin to understand global warming, they talk, start to think about solutions. Now, unfortunately, and with global warming, they're mostly thinking about trivial solutions, like changing your light bulbs. Well, that's important, you know. But we, we got together and had a big workshop on global warming at the school at Oxford and uh, looked at the, um, the really big issues and came to the conclusion there were 12 solutions which were the macro solutions, the really big solutions, the solutions which would have, would have a huge effect. And all of, all of those, are 10, did I say 12, 10, 10, 10, 10 macro solutions, all of them are not talked about out by Al Gore, not one of them. And so you can ask, why not? Uh, doesn't he understand them? Yeah, well, yes, he does understand them. He's an incredibly intelligent man. So why doesn't he mention them? Well, every one of these ten very large-scale, very important macro solutions is something you can't talk about politically. So it's the politics which is preventing the uh, talking about the real solutions. And that is the inconvenient truth. And uh, that applies to most of these. Uh, the solutions you're talking about are solutions which are politically not acceptable. Yeah. Can capitalism and democracy drive us to target Earth? Yeah, no, uh, what, what I mean by target Earth is for every one of these you want goals. Right. And the goal is very different, but for all of them you can set goals. And some of them there might be several different types of goals. The question is that our form of governance, will it survive? Or does it have to evolve to get to that state? I think American democracy, if American democracy doesn't survive, you're going to be heading for the Dark Ages. The thinking of the Founding Fathers here, and incidentally at the time the Declaration of Independence was being written, such a beautiful document, an incredibly well thought out document. Everything Jefferson did was incredibly well thought out. But at the time you were kicking out the British, the British wrote um, um, The Wealth of Nations. And that again was an incredibly important document which describes today's American capitalism. So it's interesting that you had two sets of thinking going on on different sides of the Atlantic. When the Americans were kicking out the British, the British were rethinking what government had got to look like. Now, the, the thinking of the Founding Fathers is so important. And it's, you can find it everywhere. You go around the world now and you've got democracy like American democracy with different variations on it. Thinking like Adam Smith's uh, thinking the wealth of nations and so on. Uh, not in all nations, but since uh, the USSR collapsed, there's been a, a lot of uh, understanding that the communist system, the totalitarian systems everywhere haven't worked. So there's been a fairly large move towards uh, d democracy around the world. Now the next uh, big question is how do you get these democracies being connected together? And they've got very good strong incentives for being connected together. Um, but one of the things we should worry about today, I don't know whether you've read Al Gore's uh, uh, latest book, it's about, it's called The Assault on Reason. He's saying democracy depends upon reason, it depends upon the public understanding and the, the public having the facts and knowing what are the right actions to take and uh, over the last 10 years or so, uh, reason has, has begun to decline. And you've had a sort of destruction of reason in the political process. So I, I would suggest to everybody here, read Al Gore's latest book. I think it's a more important book than the stuff he did on global warming. Because if democracy based on reason fails, and he says it is failing, then we're in deep trouble. So this is one thing that we need to make the public understand how, how great America is, how great the teachings of the Founding Fathers were, and how we've got to avoid uh, uh, deviation from government by reason. And uh, very much part of reason today is science. And there's a, a huge amount of uh, anti-science feeling. You know, well, about a third of the schools in America have banned the teaching of evolution, for example. A large number of schools in America, it's illegal to teach about tectonic plates, the movement of tectonic plates, because it's not in the Bible. And science is so important. Uh, anyway, um, uh, uh, target Earth, we can set targets for each of these, and if we set targets for each of these, we set the target which was the millennial goals, 
and in 2000. And that was the target for 2015. And the world is trying to progress along millennial goals to eradicate the worst poverty on the planet. And it's not quite going to make it. So by 2015, it might have achieved 60% of the millennial goals, but certainly not 100%. And then they'll look at the millennial goals and say, well, let's have another a attack on the subject, let's change them. We now understand there are quite a lot of things wrong with the way the millennial goals were formulated. So all of these goals are things which you re-examine perhaps every decade and say, let's uh, reset the goals, let's reset the methodologies by which we get to these goals. But if we can get to this set of goals to target Earth by 50 years from now, then all the big problems we're talking about in the planet are going to be gone away. And uh, then we'll be concerned with building the greatest civilizations we possibly can build. So I think this subject of, of setting the right goals, setting the target of the goals, and teaching them to everybody is extremely important indeed. Uh, where is that going to come from? Well, as I look around the world today, I think much of this, much of the change is going to come from corporations, not from governments. So the corporations which are the great leadership corporations which are changing society need to be understanding this and getting people to uh, have the knowledge which relates to this. So I'd really like to see Microsoft, having everybody in Microsoft understanding Target Earth, understanding the dangers of our present time, understanding the solutions and uh, getting that to knowledge to, to young people everywhere, uh, having an influence on the school curriculums everywhere. If, if uh, Microsoft continues with the greatness that this corporation's had in the past, it ought, part of its greatness ought to be to be saying, let's look at the really big problems of the planet and, and play a strong role in helping to solve those problems. Thank you. It's a great idealistic goal, but practically speaking, how do you see corporations applying resources to do that if there's no profit goal behind it? Well, I, I think great corporations, first of all, there's a huge amount of profit in doing that right. right. So many of these things are going to translate into profit of, of different types. I mean, the world's, a lot of the big problems are the perverse subsidies, <coughs> the evil subsidies of the planet. And uh, it would really make sense to say, let's make those clear to the public. And almost all of the big subsidies are hidden from you. You know, you're paying them, you're paying the money, you're paying taxes. But the total subsidies in the world's car industries is about $400 uh, billion per year. 400 taxpayers' money going as a free gift to the car industry. And uh, the petroleum industry is about $600 billion. So if you look at the combination of the car industry and the petroleum industry, and of course they're in cahoots very, very heavily, you've got about a trillion dollars of money which is coming from the taxpayers. Where on earth should that be happening? So if we can kill bad subsidies, but, and the way, the way to kill them is to sh shine a, a searchlight of knowledge onto them and uh, publish maybe a 20-page booklet which has got all of the subsidies of the world and how they affect the average household and how much money the average household is paying in these subsidies and then look at the damage that... You know, the problem in the oceans, the reason we're killing all the fish in the oceans is because of subsidies. If fishing was simply profitable, then you wouldn't be killing the oceans because fishermen wouldn't want to, the oceans to be gone. They'd want to make sure that they've got no fishing zones, which were the next uh, generation of fish are going to be breeding. So uh, well, now all of those things would not affect the profits of Microsoft, but they probably increase the profits and uh, uh, enable us to get the right, right knowledge to people everywhere. And I think this is happening. You see a lot of examples of corporations. You look at the, the change in, in GE. GE is a huge, huge corporation. And it's reorganized the entire corporation so that it uh, sells products which are ecologically uh, correct. And uh, it believes its customers are going to want to buy products which are ecologically correct ten, ten years from now. And then one or two of the very big banks, HSBC for example, is saying let's uh, get education on this stuff, show films to 30,000 employees within, within the bank. So it's, it's happening in many areas. Yeah. It seems there may be a prisoner's dilemma applied to many of these things. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's in my interest and my corporation's interest for everybody to be doing this, but individually it's not in yeah, my interest yeah. to be taking these steps. It's yeah. not in Microsoft's interest to be taking these steps individually. Yeah, yeah. So how do we get around that? Yeah, a uh, prisoner's dilemma situation. Mm -hmm. you, well, maybe you can get around it by um, getting the whole subject to be really understood. And, uh, 
uh, countries uh, passing laws which uh, which relate to this. And if you look at the global warming, we really, we really are going to wreck the planet. Uh, the planet's going to get out of control unless we can lessen the amount of carbon we're well. pumping into the atmosphere. And so uh, there you've got a prisoner's dilemma <laughs> type of argument. How do you stop China from building all these power stations? Well, one uh, thing that they put together is, is cap and trading where you have a, a legal cap in each country for the carbon that you can put into the atmosphere and if you put in more than that then you've got to buy trading rights and if you have less than that then you sell trading rights. So you're buying and selling the uh, licenses to um, put, in, put more carbon into the atmosphere than you really need. And uh, now as you look at the, the, uh, the statements which have been made about lessening carbon today, you've got a huge amount of research much of it coming from entrepreneurs, which is going into more efficient solar panels. There's 60 different technologies now for creating much better solar panels. And a huge amount of work going into um, fuel cell cars, fuel cells in general. For fuel cells, you've got to generate hydrogen. And the hydrogen is fairly expensive to tear the oxygen and hydrogen apart in a water molecule. But you can build wind generators where when people aren't buying the electricity, the wind generator is generating hydrogen. The solar panels are generating hydrogen. As you change uh, nuclear power, you really don't want to build the water-cooled power stations you've got today. You'd like to build fourth generation power stations and they have extremely hot gas, gas at temperatures of 1,000 degrees. And 1,000 degrees, hydrogen just separates from oxygen and, and water. So uh, a natural byproduct of uh, a modern, efficient nuclear power station would be to generate huge amounts of hydrogen almost without you having designed the power station to do it. It just comes as a byproduct of that power station. Yeah? You spoke about those uh, 10 macro solutions that are not politically correct. Are those accessible by the public? The, sorry, yeah. So you spoke about those macro solutions that were um, not feasible to be discussed. Yeah. Okay, so, so the, the macro solutions, um, big, big solutions relating to uh, global warming, which Al Gore didn't don't talk about. First one is subsidies. You've got to take away the subsidies from the petroleum industry and the car industry and the coal industry, and that's huge. It's really big money. And he's just not prepared to, prepared to face that. That's a huge effect. Of all of the technologies for getting us uh, electricity which don't damage the environment, nuclear is the most powerful. And uh, many countries have done <coughs> detailed calculations about where their electricity is going to come from. Um, Angela Merkel is the Prime Minister of Germany now. She's probably the best head of state that Germany's had for a very long time. And uh, she's done detailed calculations about um, getting electricity. And so G Germany's uh, putting a huge amount of effort into fuel cells, um, new types of solar panels, wind, wind generators and so on. Uh, but you can do all the calculations and it won't work. It's still carbon negative unless you build nuclear power stations. And she simply won't mention nuclear power stations. It's political suicide for her to say Germany's going to go nuclear. Now, there's a new type of nuclear power station. There's, there's one which I think is absolutely wonderful. It's going to be cheaper than uh, conventional nuclear power, and that's called a pebble bed reactor. Is anybody here familiar with the pebble bed uh, technology? Well, but the pebble is about the size of a billiard ball. So think of a black billiard ball. And it's got uh, four shells. Uh, one shell is uncrushable, another shell can't be melted, and the other two shells are resistant to corrosion. And inside that pebble you've got tiny little things like ball bearings, which are less than a millimeter across. And each of those ball bearings is uncrushable, can't be melted, and is corrosion proof. And inside those ball bearings there is uh, uranium, which is 9% enriched. You can't make atomic bombs unless uranium is 80% enriched. So there's no economic way to make atomic bombs out of the uh, pebbles for the pebble bed reactor. And, um, and then you put these pebbles into a, a chamber and you uh, uh, put a, a beam of neutrons in and a neutron go going into one of those ball bearings is going to hit a uh, nucleus of hydrogen and it's going to send out maybe two neutrons. So you get a chain reaction. And that chain reaction is very fast, and so your um, pressure chamber would be about uh, the, the, the size of from here to that screen and ab about this height. So imagine the cylinder that's that size. And the cylinder that size, when you set the chain reaction going, the temperature immediately becomes very high and it uh, generates uh, 200 uh, million watts of electricity. So a huge amount of electricity 
coming from a very small uh, unit. Now this is simple technology and uh, you could um, package that so it goes into about four shipping containers. So here's a means of generating electricity which is a nice size for many of the towns of the, the world. If you want to generate a billion watts then you have five of the things in a ring with a central uh, console. And so this is a fundamentally new type of, uh, new, new type of way of getting energy. There are quite a lot of others radically new ways and so one of the things that the recent concern about carbon you have gotta put up the price of carbon you have gotta have taxes which make carbon more expensive and that's going to happen all over the world as carbon becomes more expensive then there's a huge incentive for entrepreneurs to invent new types of uh, energy and uh, they're doing it. One more question. Question, that question here. We brought the world to this situation and now we say uh, it's the responsibility of our children to reverse the course and uh, bring us to the right to the right direction. Uh, isn't it unfair for them? Is it? Isn't it unfair that the responsibility goes to the children who don't have anything to do with the world today? No, I think you've got you've got to have then new legislation. If you look at global warming, for example, we've got to have legislation which relates to stopping the amount of carbon going into the atmosphere. And that legislation is, is on the books. And one interesting way of looking at global warming is to look at the economics. All these things, you really ought to look at the finances and the economics. And probably the best way that's been done is with the Stern Report, um, which came from the British Treasury. And uh, the Stern Report has done all of the calculations relating to the effects of carbon and climate change, mapping it out about uh, 50 years or so. We've got extremely detailed knowledge about uh, climate change, which comes from the computer models of the, of the climate, which are massive. They need the world's biggest supercomputers to run these models. And their, their, their physics is n not much that you can argue with in them. Um, and so by looking at the various options in society and then looking at the computer models, it's done the calculations and basically what it's saying is if we go on with business as usual, if we don't do anything different, if we drive the same cars, we have the same power stations, we go on essentially the same as we are today, then the wreckage to our climate is going to cost the earth about 20% of GDP. And we'll be paying that 20% of GDP between 20 and 30 years from now. Now that's a hell of a lot of money, 20% of GDP. And the same set of calculations say that if you spend 1% of GDP now, then you can largely avoid all, all the difficulties which are 20% uh, in the future. So saying, so deal with the problem now, spend the money now, uh, get things on the right track, uh, encourage entrepreneurs to do the right type of development, and then it's not really going to be a problem. Go on with business as usual, and it will become an outrageously expensive problem. And you can apply that argument to so many things here. Uh, the oceans, if you take action now, and it's not very difficult action to take, but it needs political will and it needs global cooperation, then you can save the oceans. And uh, by um, <coughs> 20 years from now, we'd have the fish coming back. And by 50 years from now, we'd have the oceans being in a state pretty much like they were in about 1970 or so, where the fish would come back vigorously. So all the different things on there, that uh, set of arguments really applies to it. Thank you, Dr. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.